Hey everyone, how are you guys doing? Good to see you, good morning. Um, just getting things underway here, hanging out with Eddie and uh, about to start another lecture on ethics. So I hope you guys are comfortable and ready to learn something and um, we'll be starting in like five minutes. So, welcome back. <clears throat> About about four minutes. So welcome back. Okay. Just a few more minutes, everybody. So, I'm almost ready to go. Here he is. Eddie. <laughs> Always playing over there. Hey, Senna, good morning to you. Anybody that's here, I guess. We just got a few of us for now. Seems like in the 9 a.m. hour, everyone kind of gets there at the last minute. So I would say, hey, say hello, all y'all, but maybe I should wait a few moments until we got more. Hi, Eva. Good to see you again. <clears throat> Hi Kelly and all the rest. Hope you guys had a good weekend. <clears throat> okay, just about another minute. Not to start early, just let everyone get a chance to arrive. <clears throat>
<clears throat> All right. Welcome everyone that's arriving here. All right, guys, so it's pretty much 9 a.m. Good morning, Megan, Drew, all you guys. Really good to see you, and um, you know, I hope you had a nice weekend there. Today we are going to just go through a little bit more material on ethics. Um, don't forget that Wednesday is the due date of the first essay, so it's not today, but it's due next class. So all you got to do is make sure to send your essay to me um, through email as an attached file any time before um, class time on Wednesday. So just get it in before 9 a.m. Um, of the next class period, and then it'll be all on time. Have I received your essay, Dhruv? Uh, well, did you just now send it? Let me, well, I'll let you know after class, but uh, yeah, I believe I saw your message this morning. Um, I could quickly tell you actually here. <clears throat> uh, oh yes, uh huh. I, I have your essay. You just sent it early this morning at like five. Or no? Is it? I see Sunday five a.m. So it must have been. Overnight, yeah, it, it's with me, so not to worry. I had it, thanks, Drew. Um, but anyways, to all those uh, here in attendance, just reminding you your essays are due next class, so just don't forget that. But other than that, what we're gonna do today is continue going through more material on ethics. So we finished up the work of John Stuart Mill on Friday and um, utilitarian ethics. So now we're gonna do different ethics. And um, this is the ideas of the writer Immanuel Kant. Okay. <clears throat> Immanuel Kant, and um, just so you guys know, he lived from 1724 until 1804. And um, he's considered one of the major moral philosophers of the whole um, Western history. So anybody who studies ethics in, in the Western system is going to come up against and learn some things from the work of Immanuel Kant. So he was a German philosopher, um, considered one of the greatest of all time. In 1785, he wrote this book, which has a very long and kind of wordy title, but it's Grounding for the Metaphysics of Morals. <laughs> Grounding for the Metaphysics of Morals is his major kind of uh, epic book in ethics from 1785. And we have a couple of sections from this major classic work that we're going to show and uh, discuss today in our meeting. Um, yeah, he wrote on a variety of topics in philosophy, whether it was philosophy of mind, ethics, epistemology, um, talk a little bit about science, but his word, his writing and work on um, ethics is probably the thing that he's most well known for. So we're going to learn a little bit about his ethical system, and um, for the most part, people refer to these kinds of ethical ideas of Kant as Kantian ethics. So that's the goal today, to give you guys a quick crash course in Kantian ethics. Kantian ethics named after the man himself, Immanuel Kant. Okay, so sorry, Pete. These cats are playing with each other. Go, go. All right, so let us get started on Kantian ethics. I'm going to just show you guys some of the basics, and then we'll get further and further into the details as we go. All right, so first of all, let me compare this with the utilitarian system so you can see some major differences between the two. In the utilitarian ethical framework, the moral principle you're supposed to always live according to is do whatever action will create the most overall happiness for the greatest number of people. So again, if you had choices that you're looking at and you're trying to do the so-called right thing, the utilitarian would simply say, do whichever action would create the most great aggregate results of happiness for all affected. 
and that's your moral obligation. So to utilitarians, ethics is about the consequences. For that reason, some have called it a member of a consequentialist school of thought. So consequentialism is just another word that refers to the ideas that utilitarians have. Consequentialist ethics says that what matters morally are the consequences that follow from your action. So like if a person does something and consequences signified by the letter C here at the tail end of this arrow, the consequences, the outcomes, the results that come from it, that's the stuff that determines whether it was right or wrong. If there are good consequences for total human happiness, it was good. If there are bad consequences for overall human happiness, it was bad. But Kant, our author of today, he is not a consequentialist. He instead thinks that the thing that matters morally is whether you acted with a good will and a good intention when you committed the action. So the consequences don't matter at all. All that matters is the will that you had. Did you have a good will? If so, then even if the consequences turn out not so good, they don't work out favorably, the action was not morally wrong. And if you had a bad will and a bad intention, then even if good consequences intervene somehow or result from that poorly intended act, it would still be morally wrong. So like um, I sometimes tell this little story as an example to give you a sense of the difference between Kantian and utilitarian ethics. So like say for example, um, you know, you were uh, trying to help a stranded motorist that looked like their car was broken down and you pull over to the side of the road, but you notice that they're in their car and they're unconscious. And so they can't respond to you asking questions. Hey, are you all right? What are you doing? So they're unconscious in their car. You notice there's a little damage to the front of the hood and like some smoke maybe coming up from under the hood. So you're kind of worried about the person because they're not answering your questions and there's damage to their car. Like they got into some type of accident and now maybe they got hurt. So suppose that in that situation you took the decision to gently remove the person from their car and set them off to the side of the road because you're worried about maybe the car catching fire and them getting caught up in the flames and getting hurt worse or even dying. So since there's no yet paramedics or first responders, let's suppose that you just gently remove them from the car while they're unconscious to help prevent them from getting a worse injury. Now suppose that as the paramedics finally do arrive, they ask you, who is this person? Do you know them? You say, no, I'm just a stranger that thought I could help. And they ask you, well, how did they get on the ground? When you pulled up, were they already on the ground like that? Or what happened? You say, no, actually, they were in the car. See, I moved them. You say, well, why'd you move them? And you're like, well, I was doing that because I didn't want them to get a worse injury. You can see their car is damaged. Maybe it could catch fire. I don't know. And then let's suppose this paramedic starts kind of lecturing you saying, well, you know what? You probably should have waited just a minute because basically you're not a professional. And a person like this, you don't know what injury they have. You're supposed to have a full gurney and a neck brace. <clears throat> if you move them without properly immobilizing them, you could actually cause them to be paralyzed if they have like a vertebrate or, or neck injury or spinal injury. And you're like, well, I was just trying to help. So suppose that what happened was because you did move them, before the paramedics arrived, you inadvertently caused them to suffer <clears throat> a detached part of the spine, and now they're going to have paralysis from the neck down, so they can't use their body from the neck down, no motor control for the rest of the life. If you had just not been there at all, um, none of that would have happened, and they would have been properly cared for. So look, in a way, if you're just a pure consequentialist, and all that matters are the outcomes, you would say that this was morally bad what you did, because you took an action, and it made things worse. And it took away all the happiness that would have otherwise existed from them having their full motor control. So to utilitarian consequentialists, that was bad because the results were bad. But do you guys get the sense of how this is different from Kant? Because in Kant's ethical system, what you did was based on a good will. You had the right intention. You just wanted to help somebody. Did you inadvertently hurt them worse? Yes. But the consequences don't matter to Kant, only the will. So when you act with the good will, no matter what the consequences are, that cannot somehow deprive the moral quality of the action. It's still moral, just based on the will itself. And vice versa. Suppose you had a bad will, but somehow something good happened because of it, right? Like, uh, let me see here. Um, you, you see that there's like two uh, people running, and suppose that there's a little kid with like a slingshot that wants to... Um, just cause a mess and cause a nuisance. So they try to fire a slingshot at one of the runners. They think that this is two joggers running along. So they hit the one person in the back uh, 
with a slingshot rock or something, and then that causes them to collapse. And they think that that was fun because they caused trouble and mischief. But suppose that after that, the person who was running in front comes over to the kid, sees them, and says, hey, thank you. You saved my life. I could tell that you could see I was running from this person who was threatening to kill me and rob me, and you gave me enough time to get away by firing that slingshot. So you're a hero, young man. Now, of course, if that's the way it happened, I guess the results were positive because had the slingshot not been fired, then the person might have come to worse injury or death. But since it was done on a bad intention, it doesn't matter that the consequences helped or turned out favorably. So Kant says, act with the right kind of intention or will. Instead of the little diagram where there was a person with an arrow pointing towards the letter C, this is more the picture that the Kantian emphasizes. That you look back to the intention that the person had in their mind when they committed the action. So I just put the letter I, it's kind of small, but I put the letter I inside of the stick figure's head just to signify that that's their intention, that's where the intention forms in the head and the mind. And the, the Kantian says, consider the intention of the person, not the future actions, and sorry, not the future consequences that result from the action. So for Kant's view, your moral obligation is not to always produce the best consequences in terms of overall happiness, but merely see to it that you act with a good will and a right intent. If you do that, that's all that's needed for your action to be deemed moral, morally permissible. So there's more detail though. The devil's in the details of Kant. If I just left it at that, you know, act with a good intention, you might say that's pretty easy. Kant is very straightforward, but unfortunately, or for better or worse, there's a little bit more complexity in the way he thinks about these topics and these concepts of a goodwill. So I'm gonna just kind of walk you guys through his more detailed presentation, but that's the overall picture. It's not consequence-based, it is intention-based. It's based on the will. And the will is something that's formed prior to the action and the consequences, but the consequences, of course, don't happen until after the action and the results come forward to kind of get the argument started in favor of his theory. Uh, he says, the only thing in the world that is unconditionally good is a goodwill. The only thing that's unconditionally good is a goodwill. So this is Kant speaking, and he says to you, the only thing in the world <clears throat> that is unconditionally good, good no matter what, basically, is a goodwill. So what he's saying is that among all the different traits or qualities that are sometimes deemed or thought to be good for people to have, the only single one of them that is unconditionally good is a goodwill. So, in contrast, all the other supposedly good traits that we could have, moral and otherwise, are not unconditionally good. They're only good under certain conditions and not others, meaning that whether they're good or not depends. But the goodwill is unconditionally good. It's good in every possible uh, case or condition. Now, to make that point clear, he asks us to think about other qualities that are often desirable and thought to be morally good qualities or just good qualities in some general sense of goodness. So we've seen this statement here. Next, I'm going to clear the board, and I want you guys to help me think of some examples of qualities that if a person had qualities like the, these, those would be considered good qualities for a person to have. So, <clears throat> all right, so we're going to run through a little list, and I'd like you to think about, if you could, what are qualities that are usually the subject of moral praise? If a person had a quality, a character trait like this, people would say, you know, that is good. Okay, so right away I see a couple of thoughts. Kindness, trustworthiness, okay. Kind, you know, being nice to other people, treating them with consideration, trustworthy, being able to be trusted in terms of the things you say are honest. Um, you say what you mean and you mean what you say. Um, I see reliability. That's good. Reliability. So the person can be relied on. They don't just flake. They see their commitments through. You can depend on them. 
I see compassion, yes, caring for other people uh, and not merely oneself. It's kind of similar to kindness, but I guess that's okay to add a different, slightly distinct term there. Um, let's see, someone says loyalty. Okay, good. The kind of person who will stick by your side and not double cross you. Um, how about some other things? Maybe some of these could be uh, also intellectual capacities that are the subject of praise, um, moral and intellectual talents, like for example, what other things? Let's get into the area of like a person who, um, okay, so logical, I guess we could just say like rational or intelligent, that's a good one. Definitely it's a good thing to be intelligent, no one should lose sight of that. Sometimes people think that it doesn't get the same social rewards uh, that it ought to get, but you'd much rather be an intelligent person than than to be ignorant or, or just dumb. So intelligence, kindness, compassion, trustworthiness, reliability, loyalty. Um, how about the kind of person who easily makes friends? What kind of quality does that sort of person have? Everyone wants to hang out with them. They're well-liked. Maybe that's because they have qualities like what? Openness, humor. Okay, yeah, humor, charisma. I think that's one that can be placed here. Usually if a person's funny and can make you laugh, you think, no, that's a good person. That's better than if they just don't have any sense of humor. Sociable, kind of in the same mix as being charismatic. I could say sociable, perhaps slightly different. Um, how about the kind of person who um, will continue to work hard, even when things are difficult? Um, is there any kind of term or concept that you have in mind of that? I have some thoughts about this, but I figure perseverant, right, resilient, that kind of thing, dedicated. So um, I'll just say dedicated because I think it kind of covers that idea. So, you know, the person, when there's obstacles, they continue. They don't just give up when things become difficult. Um, let's see, they stick to a plan. There's also a couple of things mentioned here about um, not necessarily um, talents, or whatever, or intellectual or moral uh, abilities, but also gifts of fortune. And in that range, there's stuff like wealth. You know, you'd rather be wealthy and have some financial um, security and purchasing power than to be poor. You'd rather have um, power than to be a powerless person who couldn't do anything. Um, and then I've saved for the last. Oh, okay, wait, one. One more before I put this on there. What about a person who's not scared? A person who's willing to even face a dangerous situation if it's called for, if it's needed, if it's important. That type of person we call them brave or courageous good. Yeah, so there's also bravery. Um, or we could say courage. Okay, they don't shrink away from a dangerous situation when it's important to face that. And so then finally I want to put happiness. Kant mentions this one. And that's going to be important to discuss as we co go over these now. Okay, so sorry for a little bit of illegibility, but that's his happiness there. Okay, so here's his point then. These are good qualities, all these things that you see on the board. If a person has qualities like this, most all often we're going to say it's good. It's good to be kind, courageous, trustworthy, reliable, compassionate, loyal, happy, powerful, wealthy, dedicated, blah, 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 blah. These are good things, but here's the point. They're not, none of these things here, none of them, zero, none of them are unconditionally good, okay? Meaning that there's definitely a type of situation or a type of person who if they have that quality, now it's not a good thing, okay? So let's try and think about that type of scenario. In what situation do you think that intelligence, for example, could be a bad thing? Normally it's good. No one's disagreeing with that. But what type of person do you feel like if they had intelligence, it might almost freak you out a little bit and you kind of wish they weren't as smart? Um, think about that question. Is there, what type of person would it be almost a little dangerous and scary for them to have so much high intelligence? Okay, like a murderer, good. Serial killers, right, exactly. So essentially, if you're, if you're an evil, wicked person with a bad intention, then having intelligence just makes you more skillful and dangerous, right? Do you really want a terrorist or a serial killer or a stalker to be the most 
sharpest, brightest, resourceful person out there? No. You'd rather that if the person's evil and motivated to do bad things, that they're not the smartest, sharpest knife in the drawer because that's just going to enhance their potent uh, lethality and potential to harm. So intelligence could be a fine thing, but when the person has a good will, if you have a good will and good motives and good intentions, then your intelligence is just going to enhance the ability that you have to do good and to bring about good outcomes in the world. But an evil person with intelligence is just something that we should fear. Like, right, if you're going to be a genius, you don't want them to be an evil genius, right? So intelligence in the wrong hands can be a dangerous thing, and therefore it's not always good. It can be good. Maybe usually it's good. But in the wrong hands, it can be an enhancement to harm. So that's when it's not a good thing. And the same pattern you're going to see throughout all of these. Take the person with courageousness, and they're brave. They're going to face danger. They're not going to run away from a dangerous situation to finish at what they set their mind to do. But if a person's evil and they're that courageous, then they're much more harmful and dangerous to you because they can't be stopped, basically. If they're going to face danger no matter what in the execution of evil goals, do you really want the te to deal with the terrorist or the murderer who's got all that bravery? You'd rather that they be too scared to go all the way with what they are doing. So courage in the wrong hands can also be dangerous. If it's with a soldier, you know, police officer, firefighter, that's fine. A person with a good will, at least. I'm not saying in every single case every member of all those things has one, but... Nonetheless, with a good will, courageousness is fine and, and to be desired. But it could be a bad thing in the wrong hands. Now, you're talking about kindness. Dhruv, good question. Um, I've heard it said in another context, in a different ethics discussion, that kindness looks good, and it usually is. But sometimes when kindness is only shown to certain people and not others, it can also be a problem. So suppose kindness like that exists within... Um, I don't know, circles of people who are uh, separatists or even uh, supremacists or racists, you know, they may sh display kindness to their own kind, but um, and, um, you know, unfounded bias and negative attitudes towards others. So I guess kindness can sometimes sugarcoat an underlying bad intent, and that's a possibility. So that could be one way that it's not always good. Some of these are easier than others on the list to kind of finesse into his analysis. But, um, but there's what we could say about kindness. Reliability, the person, you know, they're very predictable and they're always going to do what they say. If they're going to be that reliable and organized and effective, you'd prefer they be a good person. If they're evil and reliable, then they just are, again, a more consistent threat. Um, loyalty, you know, they among, among um, a network of criminals or um, some, some type of... Uh, immoral enterprise could could have honor among thieves as they say and that would not necessarily be a good thing and then okay um charisma being sociable making a lot of friends because of the power of your wit and personality if the person's good then they're going to make a bunch of friends and allies and win them to the right causes and right actions but if they're evil and they're charismatic then they are going to be even more capable of building a broader coalition towards evil behavior um Wealth, power, obviously wealth can be a good thing. And uh, with a good person, they'll use the wealth, at least not to harm and maybe to help people. But if you're evil and wicked, you might use wealth to greater uh, magnify your platform to do whatever dastardly deeds that you seek to do. Power, of course, power in the right hands is a good thing. And therefore, it's not always bad. But, you know, if you give power to an evil person like an Adolf Hitler or whatever, clearly that's something that no is no longer good. So power can be bad, obviously, if it's possessed by the wrong type of person. And then finally, happiness. So happiness was so important to Mill and the utilitarians. They, they made their whole ethical theory framed around the concept of the pursuit of happiness, such that it was considered to be the, un, the only thing that we pursue as an end in itself, and thus maximizing it for all was the standard of ethics according to utilitarian ethics. But Kant is talking to us now, and Kant says, no, even happiness is not unconditionally good. Well, think about happiness. If a person has happiness, but they're evil and wicked, then the happiness they have, it simply reinforces their desire to persist in the way they've lived. Because if you feel like you're really happy, then you're like living your best life, and you see no reason to change. That means if you're evil, happiness provides you no motivation to be different than the way that you are. Um, and also, he mentions, and I think this is a kind of interesting comment, that 
a rational and benevolent spectator of an evil person with a bad will enjoying the best in life it doesn't satisfy you. You feel in that case like this person, whether they're happy or not, they don't deserve the happiness that they have got. So when you have a good will, though, you'll make the proper use of all the qualities on this list. So the good will, though, in contrast to all these things mentioned here, is unconditionally good. The good will is simply when a person tries to act from the right motive to uphold the moral law. And that's never a bad thing. So the goodwill is unconditionally good. And these other things are only good sometimes and then not other cases. Basically, the thing is these can be bad if the one who possesses them does not have a goodwill. But having a goodwill is unconditionally good and it provides for the proper utilization of all other desirable traits or qualities that people could have. So like essentially what Kant is saying then is if you want to live a moral life and you want to be a moral person, then you have to focus on establishing and maintaining a good will within yourself. Uh, if you try to, let's say, just be the most intelligent person in the room, maybe you will be, but that's no guarantee that you'll also be a moral person. If you try to become the wealthiest or most powerful or the most reliable or even the bravest person, those things by themselves cannot assure that you're going to be moral, but having a good will will, of course, provide for that. And if you have a good will, then you'll make the right use of all these other qualities. Now, Anthony, you've said, can't a good will be subjective? Good question. You'd think so. In the ordinary usage of the word, good will could sort of mean a million things to a million people. Is it helping a person uh, in need? Is it withholding on a gratification for yourself to do something good for others? You might say, oh, it's just too vague to be a specific idea. But Kant, huh, does have a very, very technical and precise notion of a goodwill. So he doesn't just leave it at the everyday informal level of, you know, goodwill, just kind of wave your hands, no. He thinks that it's something extremely specific. And so for that reason, actually next, we're gonna segue into that. So what is this goodwill? All right, well, here's what he says about it. <clears throat> so he says the goodwill is shown when you act from the motive of duty to uphold the moral law. So, <laughs> goodwill. When a person acts from the motive of duty to uphold the moral law. That's when the, the goodwill is exhibited, and we have more to say about this, but I'm checking your comments. Doesn't some of these traits make up the goodwill? Like, you have to be brave to pull someone out of a smoking car. Yeah, well, nobody said that the person who pulled the individual out of the smoking car did not have a goodwill. They did have a goodwill, sure. The point is not that there can't be a case where a person acts with courage and shows a goodwill. The point is that not in every single case where someone acts with courage does that person exhibit a goodwill. For example, if I'm a terrorist and I've decided that, you know, killing a bunch of people in a public place is something that I need to do to fulfill a desired goal that I have, and I'm scared uh, about losing my life, so I whip myself up into a state where I feel like I'm brave enough to sacrifice my life for that, this so-called bravery is going to conduce to harm. Now, if I was a coward and afraid of losing my life in the same situation, then I wouldn't have done that. So it's the same with intelligence. If I'm very, very smart and I have a plan to heart, hurt a lot of people, then that's going to be a bad use of intelligence. So the use of the intelligence or the bravery or whatever is governed by the will, which is either good or bad. So by itself, it can't guarantee that it's derived from a good will. The good will, though, is the thing that licenses the proper use of all the other qualities. So you should try and get the priority of having good will first and then in that case, when you act in a way which exhibits intelligence, bravery, perseverance, or whatever, you're doing so in a way that's consistent with morality, right? Because there, look, there's evil people that are smart. There's evil people that, that are brave. Uh, it's not just good people in the world who are smart. So smartness or whatever can be good or bad depending on the type of person that has it. So all he's asking you to do is try to have a good will. And then from there, all the other qualities will just be used as they should be. 
But okay, so what that goodwill is then is when a person acts from the motive of duty to uphold the moral law. About the moral, sorry, the motive of duty. He says that you have to distinguish between the motive of duty and the motive of inclination. So this brings us to yet another principle of his, that your act only has moral worth, he claims, if it's done from the motive of duty and not from the motive of inclination. So let me put that information here and we'll talk about it. <clears throat> And side by side with that, an act done from the other motive of inclination has no moral worth. So you see here it says, only an act that's done from the motive of duty has moral worth, but an act that's done from the motive of inclination has no moral worth. Okay, so let's quickly consider what is an inclination, this word inclination. If I have an inclination to do something, this is just a sort of fancy, more verbose way of saying something straightforward. Say I have an inclination to um, get a bagel later today. What does it mean to have an inclination to uh, do anything. Having the inclination simply means, in other words, that the person wants what? What do you think? To be inclined, to have an inclination to so do something, is to feel like doing it, right? To want to do it, to desire to do it. So an inclination is just a desire usually based on your self-interest or, you know, whatever it is. This means then that when you do an action and you do it strictly because it's your moral duty, then that action has moral worth. But if you do an action simply because you're already inclined to do it, then it does not have moral worth. Even if it's not necessarily immoral, it's not done for a moral reason on that basis, and therefore it lacks moral worth. He gives this example of a shopkeeper, which in some way explains his point here. So let me provide you with the shopkeeper example that he gives, and we'll discuss that. So here's a hypothetical scenario from Kant, all right? I want you to pretend in your mind that there's a shop and there's a shopkeeper who works at the shop. So they like basically work the register, they own and operate, it's like a small business, like a little convenience store. Okay, so they sell items there to whatever patrons come in. Suppose one day in comes a little kid and this kid is quite young and um, therefore they're a little naive about how much things cost. So they see, let's suppose like a candy bar or something and they walk to the counter by themselves unattended and they see the shopkeeper and ask how much is this candy bar now suppose that this shopkeeper sees this child ask the question and here's what they know and they're thinking in their mind this candy bar he's asking for is a dollar and that's the actual price that's the market value uh, for a consumer of this one dollar candy bar but this young kid doesn't know really anything about pricing so if I want to I can say pretty much whatever, I could inflate the price right now and tell him it's a $3 candy bar and he'd pay it just the same. So let's imagine these are thoughts going through the mind of our shopkeeper when the kid asks him how much. His first thought is, okay, well, it's a dollar. Shall I tell him it's really a dollar? Or shall I gouge the price to get a couple of extra bucks for me to buy, I don't know, like a lottery ticket or whatever, right? So um, he's thinking and he's having this little internal deliberation. Give him a fair price, rip him off. It's so easy to rip him off. This little kid doesn't know any better. But then again, that's not right. Mm, I'm having a tough time deciding. I really want to rip him off. I would love to get that extra money from this unsuspecting young boy. But uh, I feel like that's just a violation of morality. So let's imagine then he finally opens his mouth after thinking these thoughts for just a moment. And he says, oh, yeah, sorry. How much is it? Uh, it's a dollar, okay? It's a dollar. The kid is like, why does he sound frustrated? But anyway, here's the dollar, pays it, transaction over, end of story. Okay, so that's version one. Now, let me give you version two. It's similar to the beginning of the first situation. You got a shopkeeper, kid walks in, comes up to the counter, how much is this candy bar? 
Now, in the second case, imagine that the shopkeeper um, just loves being honest and he loves an opportunity to be fair. So with no hesitation, he just says, oh, it's a dollar. And the reason I'm telling you it's a dollar is because I just love being fair and it makes me feel good. Um, and, you know, I, I, when other people rip kids off in these situations and I'm fair, it, it gives me this feeling of righteousness. And I'm just kind of on a psychological high all day knowing that I did a good thing. So anyway, it's a dollar. Now, the second guy gave the fair price, and so did the first one. But in those two cases, they're different motives. What do you think was the motive of the first individual? Was it duty or inclination? The one who wanted to rip him off, but forced himself not to, just to abide by the right action. In the first case, yes, Eva, it was duty. There was no desire to give the fair price in the first case. In fact, his desire, his inclination was exactly the contrary. So the purest case of acting from the motive of duty is like that. When you don't want to do the right thing, but you sort of force yourself to abide by the principle of doing the right thing just because it's right. In that case, your motive is simply to do your duty and not to feel good about it or to derive pleasure from it. Now, in the second case where he feels good about doing this, and that's why he, he's motivated to do it, it's done from inclination. And that does not make it wrong, but that just makes it kind of have no moral valence, positive or negative. Acting from inclination, even if it conforms with duty, is not based on a moral principle unless it's done from the motive of duty. So it's perhaps somewhat counterintuitive because you look at the second type of person and think, well, they're just nicer, though. They don't need some um, moral principle compelling them to do it. They just feel good by doing it. But... To Kant, anyway, um, that's done from the motive of inclination. And since we can't necessarily control what we are inclined to do or not, the best we can do to be moral is to make sure that we force ourselves by principle to act from the motive of duty, especially when our inclinations tear us in a different direction. Now, when I started learning Kant a long time ago, and even in grad school, this puzzled me. Um, that you have to have kind of like a disinclination to do the right thing and then overcome the disinclination just based on the motive of duty to have any kind of moral virtue or value associated with your act. But now, as, as I've taught it so many years, I kind of feel that I understand it a little better. Kant, I think, essentially is telling us that for the action to be morally valuable, it has to be something that is a little difficult for you to do, not something that you just prefer to do and it's fun, uh, because in that case, you're not really doing it for a moral reason. You're doing it for the pleasure. Okay, so like, for example, suppose there were two people that are both on a strict diet, the same strict diet. But I'll tell you there's a difference between the two. Person number one hates this diet. And they're only doing it because they recognize that they have an obligation to stay fit and that this diet will lead to that. So though they are disgusted by the food that they're actually eating on the diet, they do it deliberately because they know they should. Now take the second person on the same exact diet, but this second person has totally different taste. They love this food. They love this healthy stuff. They would not have it any other way. They find you know, fast food and sugary or salty or fried foods just disgusting. So they're eating the same diet as the first person, but they are, this is their favorite food to eat. Now of those two people, who do you think should get moral praise for sticking to the diet? The one who is you know, um, not inclined to do it, or the person who is, it's like eating their favorite food. You would not give a person a pat on the back and say, hey, good on you for going with the diet if it's their favorite meal. If I see you eating your favorite dish, like you tell me what your favorite food is and you're eating it, there would be no moral reason for me to give you praise because you're just doing what you find pleasurable. So it's most clearly shown that a person is acting purely from the motive of duty when there's no admixture of inclination towards that dutiful action. So, you know, the classic case is, I really don't want to do this, but I know it's right, so I'm going to force myself to do it anyway. When that is demonstrated, you're really acting with a good will because you've committed yourself to uphold the moral law from a sense of duty alone. And there's also this interesting stuff that Kant talks about where it's unique to human beings, rational beings like us, to, to have the motive of duty. Because animals and other lower life forms can only do what they're inclined to do in a given moment. It takes something a little more sophisticated like a human to have these thoughts. Here's something I want, 
but I'm going to forsake that in order to live according to a moral principle. An animal placed in the same situation will always just go for the immediate inclination. But a human being can delay gratification or forego it altogether out of recognition of what morality requires of us. But there's still this big missing part in this discussion of Kant that we have to now go over. What is this moral law that is being spoken of? If we are supposed to act from the motive of duty to uphold the moral law, well, we would like to know what is that moral law and how is it that we can find out what it is. Kant does believe that there is such a thing as the moral law, that it's objective, that it's universal, that it is unchanging. And he thinks that the moral law can be discovered by the use of reason. Okay, so reason, whether it's God-given or naturally evolved, is something that is unique to us humans. That's the reason that we can talk like this, that we can study these subjects, that we can understand physics, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, chemistry, and all the rest. So reason is the distinctive uh, feature of humans that makes us better and more important than the other animals. So Kant believes that by using this reason, we can discover the law of morality, just as we've discovered how to uh, split an atom or classify the elements in the periodic table. So if we trust our reason to give us facts about mathematics, geometry, it can also unlock and reveal the objective nature of the moral law. So Kant says that when you use your reason to discover the moral law, you'll do that by reflecting on this principle which he calls the categorical imperative. So I'm now going to erase this and put it here on the board, you know, very, very fundamentally important concept of Kant's ethics, which is what he calls the categorical imperative. <clears throat> Okay, so the categorical imperative is kind of like a little principle which expresses what your uh, moral law, what the moral law forbids us from doing in any given situation. Now, there are two versions to this categorical imperative, actually. And um, the first one is a little more complex and technical looking. So we're going to start off with that first one, and then we might run to the end of, of today's meeting with this, but there will just be a little to wrap up on Wednesday. And then we'll talk about the second version, which I think is comparatively more straightforward. But they're saying the same basic thing in just two different ways. So here's version one of the categorical imperative. I just put version one right there so you can see that that signifies that. Okay, so it says this, act always uh, so that the maxim which describes your action could be willed to be a universal law. So I'll explain that, but let me write it first. Act always so that the maxim which describes your action could be willed to be a universal law. Act always so that the maxim which describes your action could be willed to be a universal law. So, for us to really dig into this statement, we have to think about the term uh, maxim for a moment. Now, maxim is a word which refers to like a person's policy or principle of action. So, whenever you do something uh, deliberately, there is a maxim associated with the action. And the form that the maxim takes it's just a little statement of what type of action that you would do under a certain uh, type of condition. So the form of a maxim looks like this. This is just a categorical character. Form of a maxim here. The formal structure of a maxim is something like this statement. I will do, and then X is just some action. There's a placeholder because it could be any number of different things. I will do X in circumstances C, where the letter C there will also be a placeholder for whatever the given circumstances might be. So like, for example, right now you're watching this lecture, and 
you have a maxim about it because you've done it on purpose. So it would be, I could get you started easily enough. I will attend the lecture in what circumstance? Well, what are the circumstances that you chose to just attend this lecture on? Uh, I guess just because it's in session and it's on the schedule. So let's suppose that your maxim this morning is, I will watch a philosophy lecture on YouTube Live in the circumstance that it is uh, being broadcast at that time, okay? Now, to understand whether or not that's permissible at conduct or not, you then have to imagine what it would be like for your maxim to be converted into a universal law. So your maxim, your personal policy of action, you envision what it would be like if that were to become the universal law binding on all people who find themselves in the same situation. So the universal law version of a maxim is just to universalize this and to ramify it up to a statement of all. So it becomes all people will do X in circumstances C. So the question then just becomes, could your maxim be a universal law? Concerning your attendance today, let's check that maxim. So your maxim is, I will attend a lecture in case it's happening. And the universal law then would be converted as, all people will attend their lectures when the lectures are in session. Now, if that were the universal law, there would be nothing wrong with that. That would not be contradictory or undesirable. It would just mean that all people go to their classes when those classes are in session. And that by itself is not something that could not be willed universally as a law. So that action is morally permissible. Therefore, you attending right now, no, no problem with that. There's nothing wrong with that action. The interesting part of this analysis, though, is to consider actions that fail the test of the categorical imperative, that are based on bad maxims that could not be made universal. So let me give you examples like that. Suppose you're waiting in a long line, and you know, I'm sure many of us, we get a little impatient, and we don't like waiting in a long line, but unfortunately there's other people out there and you just can't, um, you know, avoid that. Nonetheless, suppose that someone's waiting in a long line, losing their patience, and they're thinking that maybe they could just do what? Anybody have a guess as to what this hypothetical will involve? The one individual in this long line, maybe closer to the back, losing their patience with waiting. And they think about maybe just doing what? What could be my example? Hmm. Take a random guess if you could. The person in this line considers cutting. Good, Cameron, yes. Well, not leaving, Megan, sorry. But cutting. They're thinking of cutting. So now, like, suppose they would cut. What would their maxim be? Okay, let's analyze that. Their maxim when they cut is, I will cut in line. What's the, uh, what is the um, circumstance? I'll cut in line under the condition, like what is their policy? If they're cutting, they have, their policy is I'll cut in what circumstance? You can just tell me that. What's the circumstances mentioned here? We know cutting is the given action in the hypothetical, but what would the circumstance of the cutting be? It would simply be when, what do you think? When there's too many people, when it's a long line. Okay, good. So what's the person's policy of action? Their maxim is I will cut in line when the line's too long. Now, if that's a universal law, Imagine that as a universal law. Could that work? Well, what would it be? It would be that who cuts now? Everybody when there's a line. But is it possible for all to cut? Is that even possible? No. If all people cut, will there even be a line anymore? No. There will just be a mass of people mobbing towards the entrance, and there will no longer be any line to cut. So it's not possible for all to act in the way that the one individual did. Furthermore, does the one cutter, does the cutter want everyone else to cut too? like he's doing? No, because that would mess up the whole point of it, right? If everybody cut, then what would happen when the cutter cut? Everyone else would cut right in front of them and they would gain no advantage. So the cutter actually wants everyone to follow the rule so that by breaking it, they can take advantage over the others who keep on following. It. If everybody breaks it, then there's no point to one individual breaking it. Therefore, even the cutter recognizes that they don't want everyone to live according to this bad maxim. And therefore they know it's wrong. So essentially, the first version of the categorical imperative, if you follow the examples here, all it's really saying beneath all the technical sophistication of the way it's worded is that it's only okay morally to do actions that it would be possible for who to do, for everyone else to do also. So if you're doing something, but it's not possible for everybody else to also do it and the whole system to continue to function and work, 
then that's an immoral action, okay? Like, so if I, uh, there's other examples I can give you and they all kind of have the same structure. Say I wanna just ride the subway without paying the fare. So I jump the turnstile and I get on for free. I'm a free rider. At that point, my maxim is I will ride the subway for free and not pay the ticket when I just want to take a ride on the subway. But if that's the universal law that says that all persons will take free rides on the subway when they want to use it. But if that was the case, then it wouldn't just be one person avoiding the fare. It would be all. And then the subway would no longer have a funding mechanism and it would have to stop operating. But of course, the free rider wants there to be a subway to operate so that they can ride for free on it. Therefore, they are kind of contradicting morality if they do something that they recognize thinking about it rationally could not be done by all and have the system still exist. So there you go, one version of the categorical imperative. And that Kant is saying reason will dictate to you what these bad maxims are. So it's kind of coming from within your own appreciation of right and wrong derives from uh, your possession of either God-given or naturally evolved reason. But that's what I will say to you guys for today. We'll finish up a little of the last few points about Kant, but we're more or less on schedule now. So for Wednesday and Friday, I guess I want you guys to read the article by Peter Singer, Rich and Poor, and, uh, and then we'll use that as uh, our next topic. So for now, anyways, guys, thanks, everyone, for your uh, attendance and participation this morning. I'll see you back then in two days, and don't forget to just send me your um, first paper before that class period, okay? Have a good one then, and we'll be in touch. Thanks again. <clears throat>